Hi, I am Jeremy Volkmar, uh, one of the board members at Clifftop. All the other board members here are Joanne Fricky and Laura Schaefer. Um, so welcome to uh, Paul Whiteman Subterranean Nature Preserve. And we're happy to partner. It was awesome that uh, Travis reached out a couple months ago and said, hey, we were out here at the uh, lunar eclipse and we'd like to have this event out here. And so um, we thank him for reaching out and hopefully this is the first of many events that we might be able to co-host together. So I'll turn it over to you guys. Thank awesome. you. So like Jeremy said, um, we're the Friends of Illinois Nature Preserves. Uh, we're a stewardship organization, um, very similar to what Clifftop does. Uh, in many cases, uh, we work on a lot of the same properties. Uh, the community that occurs in Monroe County is kind of special. It's a collection of INPC, the uh, volunteers, local uh, preserve owners, stewardship organizations, um, far and wide. So it's just is fitting that we partner as much as we do. So tonight we're kind of talking about some of the expertises that we have within our organization. So Deanna just finished her master's. And um, just appropriate, and when things are really, really hot, it's not the easiest to do uh, a lot of management during the heat of the day when it's 100 degrees and 70% humidity. So we're doing a lot of educational programs, and we're going to focus tonight specifically on moths. Um, we have some wildflower ideas coming up for the rest of the season. Um, but we'll get the show started and let Deanna talk. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, Jeff. Hi, I'm Deanna Detterding. Uh, I'm the one presenting Moths Till Midnight for you guys. Thank you so much for coming out. I was like excited. I thought, who would be interested in moths? You know, they're understudied and I don't know, there's just not that much interest, I guess. But apparently, I was wrong and that's good, good to hear. <laughs> um, before I get into my like whole spiel and everything, I'm going to go into some of my background so that you guys know where I'm coming from and how I got interested in moths and pollinators and all of it. So my background, I graduated from Redwood High School, so it's nice to be able to uh, talk to people that are in my community and, and teach them about things that I've learned. Um, but I went to Maryville University for my bachelor's degree and I studied environmental science and sustainability. When I was deciding what I wanted to do, I was like, I just want to work outside, so that's why I chose this path. <laughs> But at Maryville, I joined a pollination ecology lab, and that's where I got my first taste of field work and working with pollinators. And I was just in love, and I knew that this was the path for the rest of my life. <laughs> um, after I graduated from Maryville, I wanted to continue doing research, so I decided to get a master's, and I did that at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Uh, and I studied ecology, and my research focused on habitat restoration. I still wanted to include pollinators in my research, so I chose moths because I thought they're understudied. And I, I read a paper that talked about using them as indicator species to uh, assess like management practices. And that just really interested me. And originally I wanted to look at the difference between uh, like restorations versus remnant prairies, but then COVID happened and permitting was slow, so you know, just didn't work out that way, but I still got a really good study in on a, a habitat restoration, and that was awesome. And then now I'm graduated, and I am a re habitat restoration technician at Litzinger Road Ecology Center in St. Louis. Just started. Uh, so now for the more educational part. Uh, <laughs> Lepidoptera is the order that moths and butterflies fall into. So anytime you hear Lepidoptera, they're talking about all of them. But they are different still. The key differences between moths and butterflies are that butterflies are active during the day and moths are mostly active at night. There are some moths that are still active during the day, but most of them are at night. Uh, also, their wings, when they're resting, this is... Uh, butterflies will their wings will be like this kind of like back and moths rest their wings like this when they're standing so that's another way you can kind of see uh, which one's which granted this butterfly this monarch right here has got its wings out for <laughs> for us um, in general butterflies are a lot more colorful than moth, moths as well however this uh, Luna moth right here is not a good example of how moths are not colorful it's the <laughs> exception not the rule <laughs> Um, yeah, and then other than that, their antenna, so 
uh, butterflies, they have more long and bare antenna, and moths have more feather-like or leaf-shaped antenna. And butterflies are lean and smooth looking, and moths are very fuzzy and stocky. There were many moths that I pinned during my research that just looked like they had like really big biceps. And <laughs> I made lots of jokes late at night at like 1 a.m. in a lab. So. <laughs> Uh, there are also differences in their life, well, their life cycle is pretty much the same, but there's terminology that's different when you get to certain stages. So, eggs, eggs are laid on host plants, and then they turn into a larva, also a caterpillar, those terms are used interchangeably. But when it gets to the pupa stage, uh, butterflies form chrysalises, which is like the outer layer of the larva's uh, skin. and Moths form cocoons, which are, they spin usually silk uh, to make their cocoon. Also, chrysalises that butterflies make, they hang them from like branches or something with like, and they you know, have that one very thin thread holding them on, whereas moths and their cocoons will be in the ground in like a leaf litter and stuff like that. But then after they merge, you get either a butterfly or a moth. Another thing that's very important to uh, Lepidoptera is their host plants. So larvae need a host plant uh, to eat whenever they hatch from their egg. This, the most, uh, I guess, common, or not common, but the one that's talked about the most is monarchs with their milkweeds. So the monarch butterfly needs to lay eggs on a milkweed in order for their larva to absorb that, like, the sap that it gets, and that's what creates, that's what makes it taste bad to birds whenever they become adults. Um, so that's why it's very important for them. Um, most moths uh, tend to uh, have their host plants be like trees or shrubs. They, there are, of course, host plants that are veg uh, herbaceous vegetation as well. But as I was like flipping through the book, it was just, there's so much more moth diversity in forests, so they really like trees. Uh, this guy, this is the uh, woolly bear moth. You guys have probably seen him running across the ground. Uh, one of their host plants is elm trees. They also like maples and asters and other plants as well. Uh, but that's very important for them to be laid on a tree or something that they can eat whenever they emerge and turn into the Isabel tiger moth. Uh, and then after that, they no longer feed on the vegetative parts. They drink nectar or uh, rotting fruit, juices from that, sap, uh, and animal droppings as well. <laughs> if you've ever seen butterflies like on animal droppings, they just love that stuff. And then from there, their dispersal gets a lot uh, wider. Some moths can, uh, they actually migrate, similar to what monarchs do, uh, and others <coughs> stay locally. <coughs> moths are pretty important to their ecosystem as more studies are coming out and realizing that. Uh, one, they're very numerous, so they actually outnumber butterflies 14 to 1 globally. Uh, in Illinois, I think it's 90% of moths, or 90% of Lepidoptera are moths, and 10% is butterflies out of the 2,000 that are known in Illinois. Uh, and this means that they're very important as prey items for other animals, such as birds, bats, other insects, and even some mammals. Uh, and then they also are great nighttime pollinators. Uh, it's funny, when I'm reading up about this stuff, uh, a lot of people talk about how bees and butterflies work the day shift, and moths work the night shift. <laughs> Gotta have all hours of the day covered. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk more about pollination in a little bit. But uh, another thing that caterpillars do, the larval form of moths and butterflies, is that they break down plant material a lot quicker than uh, regular decomposition, so they're returning nutrients back to the environment a lot quicker than it would if it just, you know, died throughout the season and, and got returned, recycled. Now to moth pollination. Uh, it's, these are some really cool photos of hawk moths pollinating, uh, which they're definitely one of the most charismatic ones in my opinion. Um, but studies have mostly focused on bee and butterfly pollination and moths have kind of been thrown to the wayside. I think it's mostly because those guys, bees and butterflies, are out during the day when, you know, when most researchers are doing their research, whereas nighttime pollination, it's harder to see them, and it's just, it's harder to track, and that's not when most people are out. 
Um, there have been some recent studies out of the UK. One of them in particular, they collected uh, pollen off of moths, bees, butterflies, and wasps, and they were trying to see how many different types, uh, like different species of plants, uh, that, are, that these insects were carrying the pollen of. And they found that moths were carrying 47 different uh, pollen, or pollen grains from, not grains, pollen from 47 different plant species. And the bees and butterflies, they were uh, just a few less than that. Which just goes to show that these insects are visiting a lot of different plants. There still needs to be more research into, I guess, how efficient they are at pollinating because some plants are, or some insects are better at pollinating other plants. Uh, which is where having morphology that uh, helps moths pollinate them comes into play. So characteristics of moth pollinated plants would be that they're pale in color, so like yellows and whites. They are, uh, have a strong sweet smell and they have tubular shaped flowers for them to like stick their proboscis or their, their feeding tube as I like to call it, uh, down into the flower. Uh, flowers that are open at night or late in the evening when they're going to be out. And then also plants where they have flowers in clusters uh, and, and vegetation around that they can rest on as well. Those are plants that will be more uh, moth pollinated. The plant and moth relationship, which is what I studied with my research, uh, I use moths uh, as indicator species, and all it takes to be an indicator species is you're sensitive to small changes in your environment. And the way this, I guess, kind of relationship is, is that moths, they're when plant diversity increases, so does moth diversity. And then whenever you reduce that diversity, the diversity in moths will also be reduced. And so other studies have used this relationship to uh, detect differences in management practices. Uh, most, most of the studies I was reading were about uh, like logging regimes. So how do we cut down trees and still not impact the, uh, the moth community, which is kind of a model for other communities that they might be affecting as well. Um, and so when you clear cut, obviously that's going to be a lot more destructive and that's really going to impact their, uh, their community, their composition. But then doing like selective cutting is actually not as bad. And then you can also detect differences in habitat type, which makes sense because you have different host plants in different areas. But like between a forest and a prairie, you would have different uh, communities. Some threats to Lepidoptera would be habitat loss is one of the biggest ones. If you take away your, their habitat and their resources, they're going to not have, they're not going to have a place to survive. And then fragmentation, that prevents their, them from moving from place to place, it secludes them, and then they only have the resources in those areas, or it just makes it harder to get from, to other areas and other uh, populations. And then those two things kind of, or not kind of, they do reduce uh, species diversity in moths, and of course species in general. Um, and that's going to just lower the amount of moths that are in the area. So what is the impact of habitat restoration on Lepidoptera? Well, the benefits of it is that it provides habitat and food, you know, just what we were just talking about, and it increases their populations, not just for Lepidoptera, but for any organism in the area that utilizes that space. Uh, but there are also benefits for habitat restoration for humans as well. I think a lot of people, you know, na people who love nature, they just want to help nature and they don't care about how it impacts us, but others don't necessarily have that train of thought. And so I think it's important to discuss how it, it's also beneficial for uh, other people as well, such as they provide recreation. People love going out in nature and going hiking and seeing nature. It's, you know, it's, it's fun, it's good for your health. Uh, but also there's ecosystem services uh, such as pollination of crops as well. That's like free work, you know? <laughs> um, and that was the most relevant one to this. There are other ecosystem services that they provide as well. So why is this all important? So protecting species from uh, extinction is very important for, to, you know, keep diversity around, lots of diversity in our ecosystems because you never know what kind of research is out there that we'll discover. Um, and also that ecosystems are so complex. Moths are just one example of 
a relationship that's understudied that we don't necessarily know a whole lot about, but it's turning out that they might actually be really important to pollination and account for, you know, a good portion of it. Uh, and so there's other relationships that have yet to be discovered that uh, we could all benefit from. And then places that you can see moths and butterflies, uh, uh, Paul Whiteman Subterranean Nature Preserve. <laughs> you know, nature preserves are really great places uh, to go see nature and to support it. Your backyard, your garden, uh, that you're all going to plant at if you don't already have one. Because <laughs> those provide corridors for pollinators to get to and fro and to other uh, populations. And also there are places like the Missouri Botanical Gardens Butterfly House. Uh, you can go, I don't know if who's all been there, but that's a great place to see butterflies and moths. And then the zoo has an insectarium uh, and a butterfly enclosure as well. Here are some resources that if anybody wants to take a photo of, because I've got quite a few of them listed, that you can use to help you identify moths and insects or plants in general. iNaturalist is a great one. I use that one a lot. Uh, there's LEPS Field Guide and Picture Insect. I use those in my research uh, to help me kind of narrow down uh, species, and then I go through books and confirm. And then here are three books that I, I used, and I thought they were really helpful for identifying moths as well. And I, I have one of them with me. I should have brought it out. I'll, I'll get it out afterwards uh, that you guys can flip through if you want. So thank you so much for coming out, and thank you, Clifftop, for letting us use this space. Uh, I want to thank Southern Illinois University, uh, Edwardsville, for lending me the, the gear to be able to do this, and Friends of Illinois Nature Preserves for letting me be a spokesperson for them. So, thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, I think you had your hand up first. <laughs> I have two questions. One is, do you know which came first, moths or butterflies? Uh, moths, actually. Yeah, their moths came first. And were they... Um, all, and now I'm going to have a third question. Okay. Were they, um, <laughs> did they start out being nocturnal? Um, I'm not actually for sure on okay. that. And then my, my other question is, are there more generalists amongst moths than butterflies? Like feeders, generalist feeders. Feeders, oh that is one thing I forgot to mention. So like some moths, they don't feed as adults. Their sole purpose is reproduction. So like Luna moth, they don't feed. They just reproduce and that's all that they do as adults. Whereas other moths, they do like drink nectar and stuff like that. But, but like in their larval stage. In their larval stage. Yeah. It, sorry, say your question So are, are there more, proportionately more moths that are generalist than butterflies? Like, so like, I know some moths can eat a mm -hmm. bunch of different a variety kinds of woodies, things. you know, yeah. things. Yep. And I tend to think about a lot of the butterflies as being a little more specialist. Is that true? Um, I don't know, I guess, how many butterflies are specialists. There are definitely specialist moths mm -hmm. as well, like the uh, yucca moth, I believe it's called, or it feeds only on yucca. So there's specializations with both butterflies and moths, but I don't know if there are more moth specialists or more butterfly specialists. Uh, but there's definitely specialists and generalists on either side. Okay, thank you. All right. I was going to ask, uh, was this one of your research sites? Have, have you night lighted out here before? Mm -mm. Cool. No. Uh, my research site was Heartland Prairie mm -hmm. in Godfrey. Yeah, Godfrey or Alton area. Um, that, and I had like multiple plots throughout the mm -hmm. site. And I was trying to see uh, it, because they utilize different management on their property. Yeah. They burn part of it and they brush hog part of it and they leave another part of it just like alone mm -hmm. for like a season. And so I wanted to see if like the different management practices were impacting where moths were in, in the area. And what did you find? <laughs> so uh, I did not find any significant results. Um, I think that I had a light out and moths are pretty mobile. So I tried to account for keeping, you know, having like a really large radius and keeping my plots separate from each other mm -hmm. as much as possible, but I think that my sampling might have been a little too long and that would have impacted it, but um, I think the site is still a smaller site, so I don't think it would have mattered necessarily. I think you'd need a much larger site uh, to be able to do something like that. So a follow-up study. Yeah, here. <laughs> yeah that, it would be really it's a cool. Much bigger yeah, it would be. <laughs> Definitely do want 
spot down there, spot yeah. over there. <laughs> yep. Um, is there any moth or any type of insect that you're kind of hoping to see tonight at all? Anything you're wishing for? See tonight? Well, so it's kind of, so whenever I did my research, I did it in August. So there'll be definitely some, a lot of overlap, but as for like specific moths, I'm just looking to see whatever pops up. I'm excited to just take pictures and identify it. Things that I haven't seen before, that's what I'm looking forward to. Awesome. Why did you pick this area? This, like to do it tonight? Yeah. Uh, just a place, an opportunity, you know, <laughs> presented itself. And I mean, it's a prairie restoration. It's a large site. I also was interested in kind of having like trees nearby as well, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of moths that hang out in the forest. So my research was in a prairie, and I mean I got a lot of stuff, and there's prairie here as well. But it'll be cool to see if I get anything different that is something that is from a forest. Yeah. Okay, this is a silly question, but um, when we were just first doing this here several years ago, mm -hmm. uh, there was a guy that came down from the U of I, and um, he wanted to know if there was somebody of the cliff top people that were techie, and it wasn't me, <laughs> uh, it was a, a young lady that's no longer with us, she's gone on to other things, mm -hmm. but um, anyhow, if, if she would go around like every month, like May, June, July, August, September, something, mm -hmm. for two hours, uh, or a two mile path all the way around here, after dark, oh. and she had this thing in a backpack with a big antenna sticking up on it, mm -hmm. and um, what it did, we, we thought, all right, it was going to detect mo uh, bats, mm -hmm. all right, and we thought, and I got to be, we didn't want her to go by herself, so I volunteered to be the charming assistant, mm -hmm. and um, <laughs> it, it was really interesting walking around here in total darkness, Yeah. Uh, but anyhow, uh, we thought, okay, he's studying bats, mm -hmm. all right, and um, so, you know, we, we had directions to where to walk, where to stop, how long to stop and everything. And then she fed this information into a, by, you know, computer. Yeah. And um, like I said, we thought it was about bats, but it turns out he was an entomologist. Uh -huh. And he was studying what moths the bats ate or something. Yeah, like. that's, that's definitely possible. I, I would think bats, like with the antenna, that would be the first thing that I would think of too. I don't know exactly what he would have been doing, um, but I don't know, maybe sending out like a signal to see, I guess maybe how many insects are in there? I, I really yeah, don't know. Size. I, what? Maybe size. Size, yeah, you could get yeah. size. Um, that would be really interesting with like insects because they're so small. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'm not really sure. That would yeah, be interesting. I don't know if like bats just ate certain moths or what. Yeah. I think that guy owes you a report. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He needs to follow up with you. Or <laughs> we never did find out actually what you know uh -huh. what he was doing. But, but that's Do you remember his name? <laughs> Do you remember his name, John? No. Well, if he worked, you said he worked for U of I. What? You said he worked for U of I. Yeah. We could maybe see if he. We were working over here and he showed up. Yeah. One time. <laughs> it was Tina. Tina right. with it. Yeah. We can maybe like look him up, see if he's still at SAU or, or U of I, and uh, probably has published a paper or something. It was like, interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that'd be really cool to see. Thanks. I also have a slide on cool yeah. moth camouflage. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I mean, this one is definitely it's not in Illinois, but <laughs> I'm so sorry to tell you that is a photoshopped image. Oh, oh is it? It's a, it's a common one on. Oh, the okay. Yeah. Well, it's it. It might be photoshopped, but there. It's an example of like the eye spots. So mm -hmm. they they moths do have eye spots, and it's supposed to like freak predators out. So it, maybe it's not that extreme, but it's they have eye spots that look like similar. This uh, moth is mimicking bird poop. <laughs> Can you tell which one it what the moth is? Oh, it's the beautiful wood nymph. Yeah, it's a beautiful wood nymph. Yeah, I, f I always find that name super like comical because it's like got this such elegant name, but it mimics bird poop, and I'm like, someone had a sense of humor when they were when they were uh, naming this one. They have really the, interesting designs. On them. They look like numbers almost. On the beautiful wood nymph. Yeah. And the I have some pictures. It looks like they have 
like they're numbered almost. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. And the, the hind wings are like a gorgeous golden rod. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Quite the surprise they had. Yeah, you never know what they're hiding under there. <laughs> under that piece. Yeah. And this is really good camouflage. Like, you can yeah. barely see that one. He's really a pro. And then this one I thought was really cool because he looks so much like the branch. Those are around. Yeah, though, yeah, these ones will be out tonight. Yeah, no owl moth. <laughs> yeah, I just could have fit so much on here. There's a lot of other cool ones. Mm -hmm. Uh, here's some sources. That's it. Yeah. Any more questions? Cool. Alrighty. Well, it is. It's 8:30. We can put the light out. Uh, it things won't really start coming out until it gets uh, until the sun goes down. But we can head over that way. And I do have more information to share on like you know things that affect moth collection, like temperature, wind, humidity, all that kind of stuff. So we can learn about that over there. We should all keep our lights off at night outside, right? Yes, because you're distracting them from pollinating. They're they're attracted to the light and then they're not doing their job. Yeah. I'd probably not reproducing Yeah, they probably would be too distracted to do that. So why are they attracted to light? <laughs> that is actually so there's a bunch of like hypotheses to why that they're attracted to light. Um, some say it's because they like follow the moon, so it's like distracting them, but nobody actually like concretely knows why. So that is something that needs to be studied. Look at that. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Right. So before I turn it on, I want to tell you guys like it, it won't be fully bright right away, which is you know fine. But once it's like really heated up, don't stare directly into the light. That's, it's like staring at the sun. So please don't do that. I'm not liable. Put shade on it. Hopefully the extension cords will. That's a heck of a bulb. Hold it. Alrighty. So this is a mercury vapor lamp. Uh, it is great for attracting insects. Uh, it's what I used in my research when I was trying to decide what to use. There was UV, which I believe is what uh, is over there. And then there is it UV? Yeah, right? Open. Yeah, it's just okay. yeah. it's plastic. I could hit it somebody with it. Okay, <laughs> yeah. It looks like a UV. Which is the advantage right. of it. Well, but, <laughs> um, I'm gonna step over here, that way you guys aren't looking at the light. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this is what I used in my research and that's when I was looking up which lights attract the most moths. Um, it was mercury vapor. So hopefully we will get quite a bit of uh, mo different variety of moths. Some <laughs> Moths are attracted to like different wavelengths of light, mm -hmm. so mercury vapor covers uh, a lot of wide spectrum. So that's what will attract them to this light, uh, opposed to like other lights as well. We're so, not at ninety degrees today. Is this a little cooler today? Is this yeah, this is a bit cooler. That's another thing. So uh, conditions for attracting the most moths. Uh, moonlight has effects on that. Oh. Uh, sunlight, obviously, <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, moonlight, uh, temperature, wind speed also affects it. Uh, earlier it was a bit windy, it was blowing down these things, but it's kind of slowed down, so that, that's really great for us. Uh, temperature is, what, what temperature is it right now? It's still it's in the 70s. 70, yeah. 70s is still, <laughs> is still good. That's honestly like, that's ideal for think. us. <laughs> uh, but if it got like, in the 60s, like we'd see less and colder, you'd see less and less, mm -hmm. but it's also summertime, so they're going to be out and about. But yeah, so temperature has a big effect on that. Uh, that was one thing in my study that I, I had to kind of make sure that I had to watch the temperatures, you know, before and after I started. Uh, <laughs> like, I was like, who's touching me? <laughs> um, because I wanted to make sure that there weren't like crazy fluctuations in the temperature. Mm -hmm. And there was actually one night that was a lot colder than like, one of my hotter nights. And I even saw that reflected in how many moths I caught. I had to resample that night because I didn't collect as many as I needed, which was unfortunate, but. Um, also weather, so t uh, well, rain, part of weather. You don't want to sample for moths in rain. They're, I mean, you might get a few, but they're not gonna come out. And you cannot use a mercury vapor lamp whenever it's raining. It will explode. <laughs> so that's why I was checking the weather. I was like, please, Please no rain, because if it was going to rain, we would have to find a different light, because I'm not going to have that. Um, but yeah, it was 0% tonight, so that is really good. Um, 
Yeah, it takes a little bit for insects to Wake become up. attracted to, <laughs> I mean, the sun's still going down, um, but we can all talk and have fun, and if you guys have any questions, we can, there's also that light over there, um, so feel free to wander in between uh, both lights to see maybe if there's like different different kinds of moths that are going over there than there are over here. So Tell us about your new job. My new job? Yeah. yeah thank you. <laughs> so I'm a habitat restoration technician. For? The Litzinger Road Ecology Center. Okay. Uh, they I'm employed by the Missouri Botanical Garden, but the foundation is kind of like a separate thing as well. Uh, they're a private location, so they're mostly for... For... <laughs> okay. Don't look at the lights. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but uh, they're, they're mostly for like educating teachers and students, so they're, they're private. So people from the general public can't go see it, which is unfortunate because I like mm -hmm. seeing other people. Um, but it's still really exciting to get. So to what are you going to be doing for them? Uh, removing invasive species, um, and also we're going to be doing like seed collection stuff like that, and then throwing out seed to. We have. Um, areas that need to be reseeded. We have forest, prairie, and creek that we all like are managing. Um, there are other areas of the property that are more like well kept. And oh. whose property or where, where is this property? Uh, Ladue. So it's there, how big? It's oh, it is 38 acres. So it's it's a smaller site. It's they call it a, a mini Shaw. If you've been to Shaw Nature Reserve mm -hmm. out in like. Um, Oh but the botanical garden own, owns Gray it? Gray Summit. Gray Summit, thank you. Um, the botanical garden doesn't own the site. They are, they manage the site. Manage it. Yeah, but they do not own it. It's owned by the Litzinger Road Foundation. So, so you'll kind of be doing what Clifftop does, only you get paid. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And yeah, we'll do burns on some of the prairies. Uh, they do have like a rotating cycle, so they have three prairies, and then they, they rotate which years they burn. They have forest area that they burn, or like uh, bottomland, and then they have like what they, they call upland, but it's, it's not that much upland, but you know, it's, uh, it's good to like kind of distinguish between that and go for different species. How big of a staff do they have? A staff? So there are one, two, three, four, uh, for the, like the restoration team, it's four full-time uh, employees, and then we have two interns, and they for they 38 do, like, acres. What for 38 acres? Well, there's ed you've got education staff. Yes, there's too, education right? staff as well. Oh, okay. Um, that's that's included the education staff. Yes, yeah. Okay. Like I was just talking about like the restoration group, the people that do like restoration, but then like the education staff. Uh, I, I'm new there, so I don't know yeah. all of the ins and outs. <laughs> uh, this, you know, I just had my first full week I was last week. Say for uh, 38 acres, four people, they'd be done in a month. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there's there's so much, and they they constantly there. So they there's Deer Creek that runs along there, and so there's constantly like invasives and things that come downstream um, that they have to like manage for, um, and then like weedy weedy tree species, like you know box elders are native, but they are also uh, kind of weedy. So oh, they sure are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which you guys probably knew that. Um, yeah, so just kind of managing the invasive species there and also managing the native species there as well uh, to see, to make it look really pretty. Their prairies are really nice looking. Mm -hmm. I really like them. Their forests are looking really good. There are certain areas that they just haven't gotten around to. And so my boss was like, you, you can, you know, like you, you can do whatever, well, not whatever you want, <laughs> but you know, you can like, if you want to work on these areas, you can. And I We've was got like, a couple spots yes. where box elders are a problem. How do you get rid of box elders? Uh, cut and treat. Okay. Yeah. So each individual one's cut and spray. Yeah. I was afraid you'd say that. Yeah. Did they ever get rid of all the winter creeper near the cabin? They're working on it. They've sprayed it. It's not like completely gone. So I used to work there oh, cool. um, from 97 to 07 and they're still working on it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was that bad. It, the, yeah. yeah, it was, I mean, they, they sprayed a lot of it out, but I, it's, you know, if you don't get all of it, like it's still going to come back. Yeah. So it's something you're going to constantly manage for. And that's the thing with invasive species is like there is, you're going to constantly have to manage them. It's not like you can just burn a prairie and be like, all right, it's good to go. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, it'll be good to go for a while until you, you know, neglect it. I'm sure it it's a lot then, better now, but it was horrible. Yeah. Back then. Yeah. It, they've done a lot of really good work there and I'm very like, like it's exciting to like, you know, to 
see what they've done and then like how much improvement they've made and stuff like that. So. Well, they've doubled their restoration staff from when I was there. Too. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> so it was you and somebody else. Huh? No, no. I, well, I was in education at oh. Missouri Botanical Garden, but I would teach out there. Oh, cool. Yeah, cool. And they also have like a, a section that um, they're going to be like adding in a, a new prairie, basically. So that'll be a very. Well, it was exciting. the middle of Ladue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and they've got the 38 acres. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Middle they of do these burns. How many houses are around yet? <laughs> oh, that, yeah. <laughs> not the, a ton. Yeah. It, there's not like a lot of houses because they do have like the Deer Creek that runs along, like kind of like the back end of the property. And then they have uh, like the power line. And then across from that, then there's more houses, but they're kind of set back a ways. They all have kind of pretty big lots, too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's, they, I mean, big houses in Ladue with big yards so yeah, yeah there's quite a there's not a crazy amount of neighbors but it's I mean, they're they're all involved like they're all like you got them on board <laughs> yeah yeah um, they they all have to be like you know made aware of what's going on and like for instance like they built a new shed and again we're starting to get fun inside mm -hmm. but they built a new shed and like all of the neighbors like got to kind of give their input on like where it would be and what it looked like stuff like that because I do likes to keep things looking nice. <laughs> yeah. Did you say it's kind of by Queenie Park, Deanna? No. Uh, so do you know like Brentwood area? Yeah. It's like so McKnight. McKnight. Okay. Um, just yeah. south. It's like just south of 64 and 270. It would be east of 270, south of 64. Uh huh. That's kind of in that area, and then west of 170. <laughs> I don't want people to be staring at the light. <laughs> okay. But yeah, so uh, any other questions? Is, is Bob still there? Coulter? Yes, yes he is. <laughs> tell him I said hi. Yeah, I, I will tell him I said hi. He'll probably be very excited. <laughs> yeah. are, are the moths going to come sit on those sheets? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I know that. that's the one thing, like it kind of takes a little bit. One thing I would say is when it, it, when people start walking back and forth is a lot of moths, they kind of need time to warm up and they'll be on the ground. Mm -hmm. So just kind of keep a little bit of an eye where you're stepping. Yeah. <laughs> well, if I could see it though. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I tried to kind of have the sheets come down a little ways because some of them land here and some of them will land on the ground. So uh, land here. Yeah. But right now you're getting oh, well, here's a box. Um, yeah, there's one near Travis or something. So, yep, we've got one moth so far. Not two a day. Yep. Mm -hmm. They come in kind of slow at first, mm -hmm. but then, like before you know it, they'll just be everywhere. They'll be flying all over, and I've got I was hit by so many moths, like <laughs> just flying into me. Now, if I take a picture, do I need to not use a flash, or does it matter if I use a flash? I'm not an expert on photography, but the moths won't.